Hello and welcome to the last and final lecture in uh, this lecture series on CCNA4 with me, Joachim Shevrestad from the University of Skövde. Uh, before we begin this lecture, I actually felt that I had to start with a little bit of marketing about the university where I work. Uh, if, you're, if you like this course and is actually interested in coming here and take some courses or even a full program, you can go into his.se slash en to see our English webpage. Um, we are offering both courses and programs in, uh, in English. And the de deadline for applying to the autumn semester happens to be on the 15th of January, unfortunately. So that basically ends today. But if you want to see what we have for for the future, you can go in and have a look here. Uh, we're offering all sorts of master programs in English and uh, quite a few courses uh, in English that you can take both during the spring semester and during the fall semesters. Um, also, if you're a Swedish person looking at this, I am also responsible for a program that is given in Swedish that is called Networks och uh, Systemadministration or Network and Systems Administration, uh, which starts uh, every fall. And that is something that may may interest you if, if you like the videos and if you're interested in the contents that's been taught in this video lectures. Uh, so enough said about marketing. Uh, what we're gonna do now is yes, sum this course up with a quick lesson on troubleshooting, uh, where we will even, uh, essentially talk about uh, documentation and troubleshooting, and then we will try to do a uh, a packet tracer activity where you will watch me troubleshoot again. There's been some of that throughout this lecture, so I will not be blaming anyone who just decides to jump away and not watch that, but in the true spirit of context-based microtraining, I am going to go through it anyway. Uh, so we'll start with documentation. And well, it goes without saying, but documentation is key. It's important to keep track of your system, uh, otherwise you won't know what is going on. Uh, unfortunately, all too few, uh, few system administrators or network admins document well enough. Uh, actually had a nice encounter when we were at, uh, at a visit with, uh, with Ericsson, um, which is a large provider of networking equipment. And they said that one of the strengths uh, about what we do here in Huevde is that we learn students to document properly and that is something that is really liked uh, out in the real world even if the people in the real world tend to forget about it rather quickly. So if you want to impress, do good documentation. Uh, and documentation would typically include physical and logical topology maps that shows uh, the devices in your networks, both on a physical map and on a logical map. Uh, I'm not going to go through and tell you what they are because you should know that by now. Also, you should have listings of devices and their configuration. So you want to know what servers, networking gear and so on and so forth that are in your network and their different rules. Uh, you may also want to include configuration files in your documentation because if you look at a configuration file uh, of a Cisco device, uh, it actually is quite a good documentation in itself. However, you should, uh, you should perhaps be a little bit aware about the security issues that that may bring in, but it depends on how you distribute your documentation. Uh, also, you may want to have a network baseline uh, and a knowledge base where you, uh, where you store stuff about your network, the usage, support tickets, and so on and so forth. So let's dig into network baselining and what that is. Well, a network baseline basically determines the personality of a network under normal condition. So what you want to do when you do a baseline is that you want to know how your network performs uh, and what uh, errors that are most common in your network uh, when it's least used, when it is most used, where it is most used, uh, and so on and so forth. It's basically a tool to keep track of the health of your network, uh, where it may need to be extended, where you need more bandwidth, so on and so forth. So how would you go about do a baselining? Well, there is a six step, I think, or a three step process, let's see in the next few slides. But what you want to do first is determine what data to collect. So there are actually a lot of data points that you could collect when you talk about baselining. Uh, and well, collecting too few data points will give you too few data points and too many may be overwhelming. But you should consider uh, consider collecting data such as CPU and memory usage, 
uh, response times within your network, jitter, package loss, bandwidth usage, and so on and so forth. What is of importance? And what you want to see here is basically, are there any machines that are choking? Uh, are there any machines that are underutilized? Could I cable, uh, recable my network a little bit? So on and so forth. Uh, next, you want to identify devices and ports of interest. So you want to do your baseline and you want to cover critical servers, core routers, switches, maybe access points, and so on and so forth. Maybe you're not too interested about the performance of clients because if your clients are choking, then you're gonna have bigger problems. Uh, and next, you need to determine the baseline duration. You can just you cannot just take uh, 10 random minutes from uh, from a Saturday and do a baseline because it would say that everything is good and okay unless you're some company that works a lot during uh, during Saturdays um, instead you need to have a baseline duration that is long enough so that you can fully capture trends peaks and normal usage so you're interested in two different things here you want to see the normal behavior of your network sort of to have an average but you also want to see the peaks so maybe for instance your company has something important that happens every Tuesday afternoon uh, and if you have a large peak every Tuesday afternoon then you need to capture that in your baseline because maybe it's critical to the organization that the network facilitates that specific event uh, so that is actually it for baselining. Now let's go on to the uh, very interesting topic of troubleshooting, uh, which is something that you should do in a structured way. Expe uh, uh, most of us that are taking this course will sooner will work with troubleshooting, or all of us will work with troubleshooting. If you're like me and do errors in your configuration all the time, you're definitely gonna do a lot of troubleshooting. And troubleshooting is basically in place from er uh, in everything from the normal day-to-day -day work of a networking engineer to a systems administrator or to a support staff that goes out and help users. And no matter where you are on this map of different roles within IT, uh, you will need to have knowledge about a structured way of uh, troubleshooting. So basically you can say that it's about three different stages where you begin with gathering symptoms and uh, so you want to know what is actually wrong with the network uh, and when you know that you can isolate the problem and then you try to implement some corrective action and then you ask yourself well is the problem fixed now? If it is you document the solution so that you can know what was wrong and how to fix it so that you don't have to figure out next time if it didn't fix the problem, you'll have to rinse and repeat, go back, gather symptoms. Maybe there are new symptoms, maybe some of them are gone. You can isolate yet another problem and correct that and so on and so forth. And usually it's very common for problems to uh, see the world uh, because users are getting mad about something. Uh, something isn't working the way the users expect it to and therefore we have to uh, talk to the users to find out uh, more about the problem. So when we talk about users, there are some things that we should consider, some guidelines. And the reason why I say this is that I actually want to emphasize that it's so common for us in IT to, uh, well, not really want to care about the users. And I'm saying this because we are usually techies that like the technology of things and we don't want to care about how uh, care about the users. We don't want to, we don't understand the users, but we have to understand that the users will know about as much about IT as we know about uh, finances or cooking or nursing or whatever our users are doing uh, uh, as their day-to-day -day work. And um, uh, strange thing is that we actually try to we actually think in our mind that users are interested in uh, in IT and wants to learn but I think it's silly for us to uh, to think that the users are interested in IT on a any layer level higher than that it should work uh, so well some guidelines when we want to talk to you when we need to talk to users is to ask questions that are uh, pertinent to the problem so what does not work what happened when it broke so on and so forth uh, and you should use each question as a means to either eliminate or discover possible problems. So uh, are the things that do work and the things that do not work related? Maybe that is a question more to yourself than to the end users. Uh, something that is very important is that you should speak at a technical level that a user can understand. Uh, you shouldn't go in talking about protocols uh, like default gateways and stuff because the user won't know it and you will look like an ass. Uh, ask the user when the problem was first noticed uh, is a very good thing to do. Ask the user what 
what has changed since the last time that everything worked. Um, maybe it's something that happens when the user does something. So then you can ask the user to recreate the problem. And this is very useful because uh, the user sometimes does not know how to express themselves. So for instance, it's very common. I get asked all the time by my parents, for instance, oh, uh, Joachim, the, the internet broke. Can you please fix it? Uh, okay, let's see what internet broke work actually means. What are you trying to do? Okay, I'm trying to go, I'm trying to start my computer and it just doesn't work. Uh, nothing is happening. Okay, did you insert a cable? Uh, oh, no, I didn't. Okay, so insert a cable. It's your computer that's broke. But I will not go into the details about what internet is or the difference between layer 8 and layer 7 problems and so on and so forth. Um, so when we go into troubleshooting, when we have to go into the more technical side, uh, it's usually helpful to use a layered uh, approach to go back to the OSI model. Uh, and before I go into this more systematic uh, aspects of troubleshooting, I understand and I agree with that the most common way to do troubleshooting is to just try to implement different solutions because you'll have your set of different solutions that will work for different errors and you'll just go ahead and introduce them. But every so often you will be faced with problems that you just don't know how to solve. And in those cases, using a layered approach where you just go through the different layers of the OSI model is very helpful. Uh, so uh, there are defined in the material three different approaches for this. I'm not sure if I'm going to follow any of them in the uh, practical at the end of this tool but, or in the end of this lecture, but I'm just going to tell you about, about them and what Cisco means with them because it's very po possible that there is a... Uh, question on a Cisco test near you uh, where you will need to know those terms. So the first one is bottom up and bottom up means that you start looking for layer one reasons for failure and if layer one is working okay you work your way up. Uh, then we have the opposite which is top down where you start from the top and you go down. Uh, don't start from layer eight which is the human layer because trying to troubleshoot humans is an ass and you will find all sorts of trouble ranging from different illnesses to other weird conditions and uh, that has nothing to do with the computer. I'm not even sure why I include that in my lecture. Let's move on to divide and conquer, which is basically that you make a good guess based on the sim symptoms and you start on a layer of your choosing and then you go up and or down. <clears throat> uh, we all, it's also good to have a set of different tools when we do uh, a little bit more advanced troubleshooting. So the software tools uh, will include network management systems like LibreNMS or whatever that, uh, that monitors the health of our system so we can know what is broke. Uh, it's a big different troubleshooting and error where someone says that one machine is down but uh, when we look in uh, or uh, a problem that we can see in our network system management system that actually affects a whole virtualized node or something like that. Uh, if we need to get more down and dirty with what is actually sent over the internet, we can use protocol analyzers such as Wireshark that lets us capture traffic going in or out uh, of an interface to see what is actually happening, the data that is, that is actually contained in the packages that are sent. Um, cable testers and multimeters is something that, needs, that we need to have uh, and other physical tools as well. What those lets us do is look for physical causes of error. So using a multimeter for, for instance we can check if there is actually electricity in an outlet. Using a cable tester we can check if a, t a cable still works and so on and so forth. And don't remember, uh, don't forget the power of log files. You should always go back to the logs when something is happening and find errors in the log files that document how a system is behaving. So with this all in mind, let's do, uh, let's do a troubleshooting scenario uh, in Packet Tracer as an ending to this course. And what we will work with is the Packet Tracer assignment that is called 8.2.4.13. And coincidentally, I have it up and running already on my computer. So what I'm going to try to demonstrate here is uh, using a uh, bottoms up approach to troubleshooting this network. And what the issue is, is basically that there is lacking connectivity in the, this network. And oops, and the idea is that there should be full connectivity. 
So if I start troubleshooting, and especially, this is not a very good scenario because each and every one is complaining. If you look down here in the bottom right corner, you can see that no one can reach the outside. The reachability within the network isn't too good either. So there is, uh, I would guess, a whole bunch of errors that we need to correct. Uh, so what we would do is to just start uh, we will just set ourselves into a scenario where we are working with a ticket. So we're working with a ticket from uh, someone using admin PC1 saying I can't connect to anything. Stuff is just not working. Someone broke the internet and the world is black. Uh, so we'll start looking with that. And we, we're, we should do this bottoms up. So we'll start working on layer one. And we can see here from the greenish dots that layer one uh, connectivity to router three. That seems to be something that we have. So what we're going to do then is that we're going to troubleshoot uh, layer two connectivity. The easiest way to do that would be to do a local area network ping. So I'm trying to ping router three and that is successful. So that means that we have layer two connectivity, uh, but we don't have layer three connectivity because we can't reach the outsides. So what would we check then? Maybe we can start looking at layer three and look at different courses. So maybe the IP configuration on the admin PC is wrong. So let's start looking here and we take up the desktop and the IP configuration. This is an IPv6 device, which is called uh, 201 DB8 cafe 2 colon colon 2. That seems to be a working a uh, working address. It has a link local address and it has a IPv6 gateway that is FE80 colon colon 3. So I would say that the configuration on this machine could actually work, but let's have a look on router three just to verify. So what we will do here is go into the CLI of router three and we'll go enable and we will go uh, show running config and we'll start by looking at interface gigabit ethernet zero zero. Uh, gigabit ethernet zero zero, it should have a link local address of FE80 colon colon three. That does actually mean that this looks kind of okay. Uh, what would be a nice, uh, nice and interesting next step to look at would be to see if admin PC one and admin PC two can ping each other and they can so that tells me that the configuration as far as this part go should actually be kind of correct but then let's establish a scenario where we're trying to ping from admin pc1 to uh, to host a because we can see that this is not working and i would guess that the next point in our network if we start going uh, going in our network and walking and see how long we can get we should look at the router 3 configuration so what we established here is that the computer can reach router 3 so that is happening but the package or something is happening uh, at router 3 or beyond so maybe we should start looking at the routing table of router 3 so what should we do then well we go show ipv6 route and we can see here we need we, we should need a route to the network that ends with an a do we have that and uh, no we don't uh, actually it seems like we only have local and connected routes in here so maybe we should give back to our network documentation which in this case is the activity and we should see what we should have each router should be configured with I, uh, ipv6 EI, eigrp and use as number 100. So let's see if the EIG, uh, EIGRP configuration is correct. So let's quickly sh look on uh, the running config again. Uh, it seems like the network or the interfaces are participating. Uh, so let's look at the process as well. We can see here that the process on router 3 is shut down. So that is definitely a problem. Let's go fix that. Uh, so we go configuration terminal and we go IPv6 router EIGPR 100 and then we go no shutdown and we see that we are forming some adjacencies. So with that in mind, let's see if admin PC uh, has some reachability right now. Let's ping host A and that's successful. Host B. TFTP server that also works. Let's see if it can ping the outside world. 
No, that failed. So let's see if we have a route to the outside world. Uh, again, we go do show IP route, no IPv6 route even. And we can see, see here if we have a catch all route that should be learned, uh, I guess. Yeah, we have an external route right here. So if we have that type of traffic, it should go via uh, via FE80 colon colon two. What interface would that be? Yeah, that will be the interface of some other device. Didn't it say if we go IP route again? Didn't it say it says out serial 001? That is here. That sounds quite okay. So now we know that we have reachability to router 2 because we can go to the TFTP server, but we don't have access to the outside world. So maybe there is something wrong in router 2 and how it is taking back the traffic. So let's go into router 2. And we will start with doing enable and configuration terminal. And then we will just have a quick look at the running configuration. So the interfaces that I'm mostly interested in now is gigabit ethernet 01. We can see that it does have an IPv6 address. It does have a link local address. Let's look at the routing ta uh, table. And let's see if it has a route to the admin PC network, which is cafe two. We can see that it actually does out serial zero zero one. Uh, I'm not sure if I should be uh, should be forced to look at outside host, but this is a Cisco task. So let's assume uh, basically everything. So let's start by looking at the configuration of the outside host. We can see that it does also have an IP address that corresponds with the documentation. It has a gateway. So now we are a little bit at a blank. So maybe when we see here that there is a problem reaching the outside world, what we could do is see if someone else has a reachability with the outside world. So let's ask host A. So can host A ping the outside world? No, it can't. Uh, can it ping the TFTP server? Yes, it can. Can it ping router 2? Yes, it can. So there has to be a problem with the reachability in here. So we have established that we have full connectivity within our network, but we cannot reach the outside world. So let's look again for router 2. So router 2 should have a, uh, should have a default route to the outside world, uh, I'm guessing. So let's look at uh, let's look at router 2 and see if it has a default route. It does have a default route, but it's misconfigured as you can see here, because it has a default route, but it's pointing to gigabit Ethernet 00. So that means that any traffic with uh, unknown destination will be sent out to TFTP server. So what we have to go do is go into the running configuration. And I'm going to show you here, there is a uh, IPv6 route right here. And that is something that we need to change. So what I'm going to do is going to do uh, no IPv6. No, actually, I'm going to copy all of this. And I'm going to paste it in so we don't have our st static default route. And instead, I'm going to do IPv6 route, but I'm going to send it out gigabit Ethernet 01. And now I'm going to fast forward time a little bit. And I'm actually going to assume that this is going to work. So let's go back again and test to see if admin PC1 can ping the outside world. And it can't yet. Let's hope that that's due to an ARP error. No, that did not solve the issue. So let's add, let's add back the uh, IPv6 address that was at the very end. I'm guessing that's going to be this network right here. And let's see if it works better as that. So we're fast forwarding time again, and then we'll try again from admin PC to the outside host. Uh, still doesn't work. 
So this is always a little bit troublesome when you don't know what the error is. So let's go into router 2 and we will just try to look at the connection between router 2 and the outside host. So the way that we can do this is that we do a ping and we just ping the address of the outside host. So this is a very stressful situation for me because I'm expecting that some of you already found the solution. Uh, now it seems like router 2 cannot access the outside host whatsoever. Let's try again. Something that we could do that is actually a little bit cheating would be to remove this one and we go into simulation mode because now I'm sort of given up and want to see what is wrong. Uh, and we just simulate a package. So we'll see where it dies. So we'll do auto capture. Okay, now I am very curious as to what I did. But how the hell is this going to work? No, okay, those are different networks. But what did I do? What did I do wrong? Okay, let's go back. Because what is happening right now is that I am actually sending a package to the outside host. And what it does is send it out. Okay, now it sends it out the right way. So it sends it to the internet. I'm telling you before it, send it, it did send it to the TFTP address. But it's sending it to the internet and then it fails. So I'm going to go ahead and guess that there is a... Uh, some misconfiguration within the internet cloud right here because it goes there and then you see the red then you're gonna see the red X uh, or it fails within the internet uh, which I can't enter so I don't really know what is wrong okay but this was at least some on troubleshooting and the next time I do a lesson like this I'm not gonna go do something for the very first time because obviously it stresses me out and I can't figure it out but we did a little bit of troubleshooting we talked a little bit about the methodology behind it we've talked for 27 minutes now so I'm gonna let that be it uh, and this is actually it for the CCNA classes that I'm intending to have I hope that you like uh, liked what you see uh, I'm not going to post many more videos throughout this spring, but come summer, I guess I will be go. Uh, I'm, I actually have some courses for our master in information security or privacy information and cybersecurity to develop. So parts of that will be on video. Uh, I will also do some CCNA material, CCNA one material for that. Um, that will be in English. Um, as always, I really want you to leave comments in the comment field, uh, whether it's about uh, asking questions or giving me suggestions or telling me that some video was out of crap, so I need to redo it. I can handle that. Uh, but please, <laughs> please have a go good tone. Uh, of course, it's always nicer with flowers than with uh, than with dog shit in your in, in your letterbox, uh, I guess. Uh, however, with that said, this concludes CCNA 4 version 6 with me, Joachim Shadowstar from the University of Skövde. Uh, I hope you had a good learning experience. Uh, don't forget to read the material because the lectures are not extensive enough to, uh, uh, to cover all the material that are in the CCNA 4 material. Uh, with that said, don't hesitate to contact me if you need to. Leave comments in the comment field and I'll try to respond. Uh, have a good day and goodbye.